We're here with Hytham and time for another founder success story. And this one's going to be really great because I've been looking forward to meeting you for quite some time in, in person. We've talked a lot over Slack and we've interacted with each other. And so let's, let's just jump right into it. Founder group success story. This is one of the ones that, you know, we've celebrated because we've watched you grow and change and engage and interact with other founders. So things are going to be fantastic. So how about you introduce yourself and then tell us what's your startup? What's Wings? What are you building? Oh, thank you so much, Ed. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, my name is Haytham Albaik. I'm the founder and CEO of Wings. And uh, we started this lab back in 2017. It's designed for the services industry. And it's something that we looked at. And I realized early on that it's going to hit a certain point where it may just not be able to sustain itself for a very long time. And it comes down to people. So this particular lab was highly technological from robotics, automation, artificial intelligence, and software, but that was second. I was very clear from the get-go that that needed to be second. And we needed to look into how we approach the service industry with people first. So we didn't know what technology would make sense at the time, so much that we had so plenty of them, but we needed to step back and say, okay, what is retail like? in 10 years or 50 years or 100 years is it still the same thing how can i feel more liberated as a staff at the retailer as a chef and as a customer with more versatility in my life so it was fundamental research from people who worked in the restaurant industry from chefs from baristas from people from manufacturing industrial from really tier one companies ai and software coming together really sitting down and thinking okay how do we want to see our life in the future? How are kids going to live in the, in the future? So that was 2017. By 2019 was officially uh, incorporated and it was uh, with the branded name of Winx. The original company, actual company came, name is called Let's Butterfly, which is let's, you know, blossom mm -hmm. essentially, mm -hmm. come out of a cocoon and have a little bit more color out of it. Mm -hmm. But Wings is more of an elevation. Let's elevate the industry as a total. So, and here we are post COVID and post pandemic and, you know, we, we didn't predict it, but we predicted something is going to happen. And uh, the need for automation and robotics has become very, very important. So this is, we came out of stealth in January and uh, of this year, actually, to, to kind of showcase our first product into the market. And what we realized is the most important aspect of it was this huge uprise, exponential growth of online ordering. People just wanted to online order, pick up, pick up, pick up, pick up. And we knew this was going to happen. People are, you know, the retail industry is slowly picking it up. And, you know, e-commerce had it for a very long time. But in the physical world, like brick and mortar, it took a while to kind of catch up. The, brick, the, the pandemic just pushed us a little bit towards the edge. And now it's like almost 80% of the sales of a retailer. And now we have this digital world competing with an analog world and it's losing. Uh, the, the, the analog world is losing. So we said, okay, the first product we need to fulfill here that makes a lot of sense sits right in the middle between the customers and the business, right? The last thing we want to do is not only satisfy one, but level the playing field across two different logistics. Okay, but if you think technologically, people will say, well, okay, we'll just, we can just have a robot that just you feed it something and it will move around and give it to somebody else. We said, no, 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 no. There has to be particular constraints. Number one, we need to understand retail. We need to understand restaurants. We need to understand people. First and foremost, the space that's available at retail, it is the most, it's the golden rule. You don't want to take that space. So how can you make a product that takes no floor space? Okay, that was challenge number one. Challenge number two, how do you free up the people who are assembling the products to deliver to a person and the person who has to pick it up? That's number two. Number three, if I have to deliver somebody to someone, that's fine. What if four people walk in at the same time? Can I deliver to four at the same time? That's challenge number three. So these are the things that we started to put constraints and the only way we can really elevate the retail. Here we are introducing the, our autonomous delivery system for pickup orders. So we did what we call engineering separation of concerns. Essentially, 
the automation system, the robot system should be far away from people, should not be involved in the space where people are, and the people should be freely roam around. The Right now, what, what's happening right now in retail, or they have shelves, right? They take your product and they put it over there on the, on the shelving and you have to walk in and say, which one is mine? Oh, yeah. I'll tell you two stories. I'll tell you two stories. One, I walked into one and there was a guy behind me who wanted to pick up their order. I'm still looking for my order, right? There's like 20 of them up there in the bags. And the guy behind me is like waiting. I'm like, what are you waiting for? He's like, my name is Jack. So I look around, there's like three bags of Jack. So he's looking around, touching each one, which one is his? And I'm like, that's not contactless. That's really terrible. The second example was there was this little girl wanted to pick up her order. Her order is way up there on the shelf. She would never be able to pick it up, right? So now what we're realizing that the customer service experience went really down. Here's number three. 90% of the time when they said my order is ready to pick up, it's not on the shelf, (laughs) which means I have to go disrupt the staff, disrupt what they're doing, and that's not good for them either. You know, they're doing the best they can, understaffed already, really focusing on their orders and getting out to the customers. This is the reality, and you have to live it. With that being said, in the middle of COVID, I actually decided to take time off from the company and jump into working for nine months to actually around 10 months at a restaurant locally here. Wow. So they used, they used to make $4,000 a day. When the COVID hit, it went down to like $300 a day with less staff. There were healthy restaurants, so the gyms closed, all the healthy places closed, so they lost everything. And he was a good friend of mine, the owner. And he was nervous. He was wreck. And I said, listen, I would love to jump in and see what's going on. You don't have to pay me a dime. I was like, what? So I went in. I cleaned floors. I cut meat. I made barista drinks. I had to deal with DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub tablet, make phone calls and, and customers. And, and I, I learned so much from that experience. And if you had data people outside collecting data from the outside, trying to see what's going on, they'll get some good data. But the reality is being involved there changes the whole game. Why? Because it's about people. It's about the staff. It's about the customers. Technology is only a facilitator, not a solver to problems, right? So number one, fear. Fear is the biggest, biggest issue in retail. From a customer standpoint, oh, is my order ready? Oh, is, 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 do they get the right ingredient? I have allergies. Did they forget that they mess it up? Uh, they said 20 minutes. Is it really 20 minutes? Do I have to come back later? I have a meeting in five minutes. Can I get the order when I wanted to? Oh, shit, there's a line ahead of me. Am I, am I, is, am I getting my time? Then you have the delivery services. Some of them don't speak English, so they shove the phone in your face. I'm here to pick up this order. I'm like, you have the wrong screen on. I don't know what to help you here. Miscommunication. Lack of transparency creates a huge amount of fear and lack of confidence in the customer side. In the staff side, you got this barista working, trying to make sure sure, the order she's doing at this point in time is correct, while there's 20 others coming through at the same time. And making sure that if one order goes wrong, one order returned, now the whole process goes crazy. And nobody is tracking it in a very annual manner. So with that in mind, I realized that you have to have people hyper-focused on their station. They leave their station for a reason. They do multiple things at once. You are guaranteeing really loss of operational efficiency. I did few changes, slight changes in logistics, changed where the concerns are and added one more person and increased morale. The company, the business was able to make up to $2,000, $3,000 back again, not all the way up, but a little bit more. I took all that experience with me and realized, okay, to make this happen, if I want to introduce a machine that essentially I was the robot, what would be the robot version of me to make this really much better, right? So okay. this is essential what it comes down to. Okay, so hang on. So I'm hearing new, <laughs> I've never heard these stories before. So it's absolutely fantastic. We need to unpack this, okay? Sure. So back 2017, you said you started a lab. So you didn't actually right. even start to say, I'm going to solve this problem, you pretty much started a robotics lab where you were exploring the possibilities of robotics technology. I got that right. Okay. Yes. That's where, that's where I spent $160,000. I sold everything that I owned for that. Wow. So you pretty much built your own playground sandbox and you said, I'm going to do it. But what was the purpose? 
Were you planning on making money? Were you going to take on clients? What was the initial purpose of that lab? Good question. I lived all my life in cafes. Um, I run, my innovative ideas, all my solutions, algorithms come sitting in the lab, sitting in the cafe documenting. I have like 20 books of these things. And I keep an eye on the people working, the staff working, and also the customers coming in. And I realized very quickly that as things start to pick up, there's less time given to the staff and less time giving to people. I realized because of that, we as people have less time for ourselves less time for us to have a creative opportunity. People are working in there doing the same thing again and again and again, not feeling really that fulfilled, just so that they can make some money so that on the weekend they can have some fun with their friends. And we have kids, 17, 18, 19, dedicating this life to work just so they have time for other people. I realized the service industry from the get-go was designed and built to elevate other people. It's people for people to make your life simpler. It hasn't. It actually gotten a little bit more difficult and stressful. So when I realized this is that technology is not aiding us, slowly but surely we're adapting to it rather than technology saying, well, we have a life that we need to operate. What's the technology going to make that happen? That's what it started. So I didn't have a product in mind. All I knew is how can we make more people free? Plus, we needed more entrepreneurs in the industry. Well, that's fantastic. So this is an amazing story. So I hear you had a lot of empathy. You're making observations in the world, a lot of first principles thinking going on there. And then you said, you know what? I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm <laughs> going to go out and solve this problem. And you Correct. pretty much bet the farm. That's an all in moment. That's not a, yes. a little tiny, you know, let's experiment. You really went all in. And now what happens is 2017, you're, you're growing and you're developing these products. And then you decide to take this crazy experience. You go pretty much right to the front lines to get face to face with the problem. So you worked for a restaurant for nine months for free just mm -hmm. to study. Right. How are you supporting yourself? How are you living during this whole time? As minimally as possible, right? So uh, no car, nothing like that. And whenever I have to go somewhere, it has to be a lift. My food, thankfully at that time, was sometimes the barista or the cook will make me a lunch dinner for me just to have during that time. And that was more than enough. And, you know, half of, you know, about 10% of my day I spent in meditation and, and, and working on my spiritual self, which is grounding myself, realizing what is really important here. However, I did raise beyond my normal, my, my own money, uh, friends and family, which was small, about 80K, and then raise an angel round when I built a first prototype of an AI bi-directional software a platform, essentially a real-time platform. And we have four demos you can watch on our website, on our YouTube video that still nobody has, um, which was really solving a really big problem with communication and transparency between what's going on at the retail and how busy it is without having to walk into it. So with that, we're able to raise an angel round of $250,000 in which we wanted to kind of figure out what to do. But when COVID happened right after and I threw out my restaurant, I realized, you know what? labor and software has reached its limit at some point when you have 100 orders or 50 orders you want to deliver take an object from here to over here software is not going to do that for you <laughs> nor if you are lacking the labor workforce to be sustainable to be able to do that for you so i realized as much as the software was cool we needed something beyond that a platform that underpins it what I actually predicted at the time is what Tesla did with the auto industry from traditional cars to a hardware platform for amazing software. And what Apple did with the traditional phone to a smartphone hardware platform to an amazing software is what the retail market is going to go through right now. What's missing is a hardware platform where all software can blossom even more, tapping into data that they would never otherwise could because they were involving with real people. It was not 
but not robot. So if I have to take an object from here to here or from prep to to the uh, assembly station or from the storage to prep, this was happening manual. You couldn't track these orders. So workflow was still analog. I wanted to tap into the workflow data. So you needed the hardware in there to make sure that happens and does something more. Okay. And honestly, after that experience, I just want to share very quickly, yeah. I decided to open source my knowledge. I went out and did a one hour live session sharing with people, with industry leaders, how you take a traditional retail and through a path to an autonomous one. I started going into stations, workflows, defining it with actual business, with the actual autonomous models, what do you want to use and how to apply it. Well, and that this is what makes the story even crazier. So you are developing products, you raised money for one product and a set of products, and you had a certain investment thesis. Then yes. COVID hits, everything gets disrupted, what we call a VUCA moment, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous conditions start to start to show up. And whereas everybody else is scrambling, obviously you're dealing with the implications of that as well, but you looked and you used that as an opportunity and you gained a unique insight. Then you literally became your own MVP by going and you know, working, and you didn't just learn the problem. You said, how can I solve the problem without having to build your solution? You were the solution you tested out. And then you began educating the marketplace and talking and gathering that data information, which then brings you, brings us to this solution currently right now, which you're doing funding for fundraising for, and that it has been a culmination of a journey, not just one aha eureka moment, but you've invested so much into learning about the problem and understanding and the skills, your personal spiritual journey, developing empathy for the customer and for the worker. It's all come together to this moment right now. That's what I'm hearing. That's what I'm trying. And I'm thankful for the people around me to give me the opportunity to allow me to kind of throw myself in the fire and essentially try to learn from, from this experiences. And it's not always easy. It's not always simple. Sometimes your ideas are so ahead that people will just look at you like, are you crazy? Are you high? Are you drunk? What's going on with you? And you have to take that and say, okay, how do I can translate this even better? Which really was my journey in the pitch deck is that the communication was the most difficult thing to do because of the other side where you have no control over how they perceive the information. And when you understand the psychological work there, you'll understand why saying less in a profound way is much more powerful than just telling a huge story. Okay, so we're gonna talk about this because <laughs> I've had the joy of working with you like right when you came in, Sure. The first pitch deck, we went back and forth. And, uh, you know, I, I, I was actually what attracted me was you were featured in a trade publication, you're putting out media as something that I think other founders can learn from you, you really do manage your digital presence, your digital footprint really well. And so I, I caught wind of that, you know, obviously, we got hundreds of founders that, you know, I see on a daily basis, but you caught my eye. I said, let's take a look. We started going through it. Obviously, robotics, everything is, you know, just it's automation exploding. And so I, I've had the joy, like I said, of, you know, being at the beginning of this journey with you. So let's talk some numbers right now. How much have you raised with this recent deck that we're going to go through? So the deck, the goal was to raise $1 million convertible note. Mm -hmm. And so far we're closing around $500,000 already. Okay. And you know, this is just January, it's not too long ago. And through this journey, we learned a lot. And, and I was actually kind of paused because now I'm very strategic what the other 500,000 is gonna be for. And it's not gonna be from the same sources I had from the learning experience. And I'm more than happy to share that too as well. <laughs> sure. Yes. Let's get into it. But let's let's look at your deck because again, and I wish I could show, Please. you know, before and after. We would have to go through archives. But I remember your first deck and it was a okay. tomb of knowledge. So technical, so much information there. And you, the deck that you have now is like a night and day difference. 
you you've reduced it. And, you know, we tell founders all the time, you know, true genius comes in, in terms of being able to distill something down into something that can be communicated so easily, like simple, simplifying things. It's not simple, but simplifying it takes a lot of effort and a lot of work and a lot of iterations. And so if you asked me, you know, can you put together a 30 slide pitch deck? How long would it take? I'd say, yeah, I could probably do that in a day. But then if you asked me put together the same pitch deck in 10 slides, I'd be like, you know, give me a month. Like that's how much work, extra work that's it right. takes. So I've seen this iteration. Right. Let's take a look and you can walk me through um, this thought process. Okay. So right. then world first automating delivery for pickup orders. What I love about this is just really straightforward. No marketing jargon, you know, world first, you could, mm-hmm. you could claim that's, you know, a bit of hype there, but you're just mm-hmm. straightforward automating delivery for pickup orders. How did you come to, to distill this down? So there's three messaging here that I wanted to focus on, right? Okay. This either see this one either gains interest or doesn't gain interest. Mm-hmm. This is the first thing that an investor or anybody interested in this company would want to see. Number one, and the most important thing I knew that a visual speaks thousand words. And how can you present something visually that can tell a story without having to annotate every single little thing, mm-hmm. uh, like a spec sheet? And you're like, well, that, that doesn't really, it doesn't sound easy now, does it? So first, what's the company? Wings. Okay, how profound is this? I'm going to shout out there and say, this is world first. Okay, <laughs> well, that's a big ego. What do you mean by world first? Remember, the deck is not there to get you an investment. The deck is there to get you to a meeting for a potential investment opportunity. Right on. Like a resume. Uh-huh. A resume is not going to get you a job. Uh-huh. A resume is get you in the door. Uh-huh. Right. Uh-huh. So, and the resume, you could say, I'm the best programmer in the world. I can code AI with my eyes closed. Okay. Prove it to me in the meeting. <laughs> when we meet, I can't prove it to you here. So, the second thing, what is this? Automating delivery for pickup orders. You have to explain this to somebody who has no clue about this industry at all. If they do, it helps. But if they don't, they also would be maybe interested to look into this industry as well. That's it. Any more than this, then you are getting the consumer, the the viewer very confused. It's my name, my email address, and the last time this deck updated. So they have a feel as to how recent this is. And the fact that shows there also that this is being revised as it grows. That's Perfect. It. Okay. I love it. I love it. All right. Now, again, you boiled this down to your problem statement. And before your problem slide was packed. So yes. walk us through what did you experience to get to this point where you're able to boil it all down? What was the process? Now, what I realized when, when people look at this slide particularly, they have one thing to think about, right? And this one thing, they want to understand two things from it, right? Where is this focus of the problem and how big is this problem? Hmm. That's all they want to know at this point. Uh When you define these very well, the rest of your deck can define itself because you just have to answer the question. You answer the problem, right? So I knew the, the problem was to do with pickup ordering. Okay, so it has the title said pickup, so it should have should be here pickup ordering. Okay, this is a good news or not. It touches on two things. It affects the business affects the customer. Great. Okay, it's retail to do with pickup. It's affecting both the business and the customer. Okay, how big is this problem? $34 $34 billion revenue worldwide. Mm-hmm. Holy shit. You, so now the investor is looking at this, so you can solve this? Mm. I don't know how. I don't really <laughs> get how, but you are in a market that has $34 billion of worth of revenue that you can bring back. Okay, that gains interest. So I wanted to do this in one statement. Trust yes. me, this was iterated so many times. <laughs> Initially, because like, are they going to get it? I need to explain the problem in different levels. No, it's not important. (laughs) They don't, they have less than a minute to decide the first slide and the second slide and then close the PDF or keep reading. Fantastic. What I like about this point out, you, you show that you're, you're explaining that there's a huge market for this exponential growth. No, one's going to doubt that. 
because everybody has contextual they live through, especially investors. Yeah, exactly. They they're living this right now, but then you talked about a very big pain point. So you clear, clear communication of the stakeholders and the pain points. So I'm hooked by this point in time. And then, all right, walk us through the solution. Solution is what are you actually doing? Don't name the product. Don't talk about its features. Don't talk about anything else. What's basic, basic functions that really perhaps gonna solve this problem that you're speaking of. It's a hardware platform. That's number one. This is not a software product. It's a hardware. It's not a hardware product. It's a hardware platform. It automates the delivery logistics and notifications in real time for pickup orders. Why? Delivery logistics is okay. So you're taking the delivery aspect, the logistics aspect, and you're automating it. Get it. So you're taking people out of the equation and now you are reducing errors and things like that. Notifications for pickup orders means now the customer is getting notified when things are happening in real time. Hmm. What does this mean at the end of the day? The business saves money delivering orders. The customer saves time picking up orders mm -hmm. because we had these two problem statements previously. We talked about the problem being analog. Now we have a digital hardware. We talked about that it is a problem in both the business side and the customer side. And I'm solving the problem from a hardware platform and how it will affect my business and customers. I'm not talking about how much money. I'm not talking about exactly how even. I'm not talking about anything about this and saying this is what this does and this is what the focus are. You like it? You can move on. If not, we don't have to talk anymore. <laughs> it's fantastic. Again, one of the principles is be so clear and concise that you can get to know as quick as possible. And that's what you're saying is like, if you're not digging this by first slide, second slide, third slide, like keep going, like just cut bait and, and go, right. we don't have to keep talking. Another thing I want to point out is that you directly address the pain points, the stakeholders with your two points, business, save money, customer, save time. It's fantastic. Right. Okay. So question for you, Let, let's, let's, kind of set some context context here for a moment. How many pitches have you done? Walk me through. So how many calls in your, in your mind? Because I know you put out this information. That's the reason I'm asking. How many calls have you done? How many live pitches have you done? And then how many has, have converted? I don't have, I don't have exact numbers, but I just recently posted on LinkedIn that a total, total contact, meaning communicated, was about 143 so far. This is from a list that's over 300 that I've contacted that some of them were wrong numbers or something <laughs> did okay. not reach back. But in terms of communication, it's about 143. In terms of actually pitching the deck, because many, many times I actually got funding without pitching the deck was just over the phone and people were just jumping onto it. Okay, the hang actual on. actual pitching. Wait yeah. a second, wait a second. Those people who just jumped on so when you contacted them, you sent them an email and then you actually gave them a link to your deck so they could look now as well. We had a zoom call. We had a zoom call. We talked through it. I didn't even know the pitch decks. Like what are you trying to solve? Show them just maybe one picture of what this looks like. Some of the hardware stuff that we had. And they're like, I get it. I get it. Look, <laughs> I have 20 K in my pocket right now. I can invest in this. I'm like, great. Here you go. We'll contact in this and we're done. So it depends Perfect. on the person. Okay, it depends yeah. how risky the person is on the other side. Yeah, so absolutely. don't follow a certain procedure. Listen to yeah. who you're talking to. See where they fit in into your audience that you want to target. Um, so in terms of pitching, I think that was about you know, 60, 70 about those, um, which is quite a lot if you think about it. And how There's long did each pitch last in general? Uh, it should be about 15 minutes okay. um, if, if there's Q and A in between, um, a bit longer, but there were times where I would go first slide, second slide, and they'll be like, you know, is this in your space? If this is not in your space, I would end the meeting immediately. Wow. I, say, I don't want to waste your time. I don't want to waste my time. There are calls where I finished the call and sent him an email and said, look, I didn't feel good about this meeting. You guys had questions, which is really great questions, but you're not in the domain expertise. This will take more energy for me to try to convince. There's hundreds more that I can talk to. Can we end this right now? So it's okay. very important to control your audience. Hang on a second. Sorry. <laughs> okay. No, I, guess. Uh, I love this. this. This has been great, man. Uh, I hope we get together in person, you know, one of these days and really yeah. hang out because now 
But what does it take? Because most founders are so desperate, right? They just want to make the investor happy and, oh, wait a second, I can do this. And they're trying to shoehorn the deal. In your mind, what does it take to get you to the place where you say, you know, I didn't feel good about this and you're telling them no. Like, how does, how do you get there? Uh, how do I get there? It gets there from the sense of, it's like, it's like you're having a, it's like a, a football team or a soccer team, right? You have, you have so many people around that can play with you. But when you find that synergy together with that person, like, you know what, you could be a great goalkeeper for us. You know, I don't know you very well, but the way that we talk and what's important to you and how we play is resonating. It doesn't mean those investors are wrong. It's just they're not in resonance with what we are because you want the sum of the parts to, to you want to be the whole to be larger than the sum of the parts. And it's not about money. Remember, investors is about resources. Financials is one of these resources. Domain expertise is important. Connections is important. Elevating this product further, it's important. I need to surround myself with people that are better than me. Hmm. Then otherwise, I'll end up micromanaging. So it's important to have the confidence within yourself. Do you know what kind of team you like? Investors are part of your team. They're not no different. And you have to know, are you resident with us? After we invest, am I going to sit down and talk to you? Are you willing to be able to take a pivot? Are you willing to take another risk like I would take? If you're not on the same page as I am, then this will be a problem later on. Whatever investment money you're gonna give me is not worth it, not one iota. Beautiful. You're not seeing the investor as just a source of money to solve your problem. No. You're seeing them as a team member, someone that you are gonna collaborate with, a partner, and that's the way, like we, we just don't choose co-founders or you know, choose employees willy-nilly. You had, had you were very deliberate and intentional, and you forecasted issues that could occur if you brought on the wrong fit. You know, and that's what we call the misfit, right? They become misfits. And there's a there's misfits, and there's another one of this too as well. So I'm also looking for advisors, but here's the key. For example, I worked really hard, and I was able to get an advisor who happened to be the senior VP of Starbucks of global operations and growth for 14 years. <laughs> right? And he's Jim McDermott. And we had a call. And what I want to do is share with him what we're working on. And the goal is to get advisory role from him because he has domain experience of internal operations and scale. And at the end of the call, he was so buzzed. It's like, I would love to advise you. Then I told him, me too, but we have a rule. And I said, there's a rule. What's the rule? Every advisor must invest in the company. And it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, you have to invest. Like, why? Because if the skin is, is not in the game, how do I know how you are involved? You can love the idea, then you can just kind of every week or so you give some advice and step back. But when your money's in the game, now it's your company too. It's not just me. We're all working together for something more innovative. And, and before I wanted to close the call, I said, think of the children. <laughs> Think of the future. <laughs> and he was sold at that point. And uh, it was really loving. And honestly, right now, randomly, he would text me, he would wake up in the middle of the night, some ideas would come in. And this is the kind of relationship that I like. It's because it's challenging me. And it's also challenging him too, as well. So investments can come in many different forms. But how did you get him on the phone? How did you even get that call? Oh, I had friends like Yara and other ones who used to work at Starbucks, I kept connecting and talking to a lot of people sharing my ideas. And to connect to him, it was through more other connections. That's why I think the communication of your ideas outside your, your group, your echo chamber is so critical. You want to hear no's. You want to hear, I don't get it. You want to hear people saying, this is a bad idea. You want to hear things like, I think you're wasting your time. This is telling you what is the market that you're involved in so that not because they're wrong, it's because it's just simple communication. And through that again and again and again, and focusing on the core principle that you're not here to make money, you're here to really enhance and elevate the industry, will slowly start to feel like, you know what, I don't want to do it right. Hey, I know this guy, talk to him. No idea where things going to go, but it's the tenacity, the determination. Look, I'm not motivated. People say, how are you motivated? I'm not, I have no motivation whatsoever. I am devoted, like a mother devoted to her child. 
she doesn't need to be she doesn't need to read the quote to say please you know take her child no she will do it she doesn't need a quote to remind her how important to take care of her child because it's coming from the heart entrepreneurs working on something has to come from a devotion where the mind is second that the mind is there to say how can i make this happen for you i know it's the most difficult thing if it's motivation then your mind is first now the mind will lay out all the possibilities that can go wrong i don't care about that i care about all the possibilities that can go right and i want to go through that one instead and try them how far-fetched it may be so this is where i think that the 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 difference that i bring in the table that people say why do i wake up in the morning do this i said i i don't wake up and do this i don't do anything this is just how i breathe this is how i am it's like a kid wake up in the morning and they jump and play lego they have no idea what they're building <laughs> they have no idea when it, when it's going to be done but they're creating so we need to get to that state of creation that's the only way we can go through this friction in this entrepreneurial journey I think I'm having a spiritual experience just listening to you right now. So uh, thank you so much for sharing. L let me let me ask a question. Now I'm curious. You got me more curious. This deck, Please. when you're mm. when you got them on the phone and they're asking you for a presentation, 50 minutes, you're using this deck that we're looking at right now. Correct. OK, so then model it for me. Let's just go through the first three slides. So, you know, let's role play. So. How would you open with this deck and how do you talk through the problem and solution slide? So just go ahead and, and just kind of demo it. Sure. I, I would I would put a height on this is that every person I talk to, I spend almost an hour research on that particular person. Wow. To see what resonates and what resonates and use the words that make sense to them. If somebody is in the re retail industry, I know how to reach to them very quickly. If somebody is not, let's say in the automotive industry, I know how to reach them differently. So there's that variety. I'm not Great a robot advice. that repeats the same thing all the time. Great advice. They want to they wanna feel that you're connecting with them, right? Yes. So here, I would say, when I start this presentation, I say, welcome, this is Wings. We are finally building a product that nobody is touching in the world right now, where we want to help the service industry deal with the current pandemics and with the people that right now is struggling and suffering inside and our customers. This is our automation system that takes no floor space and focusing on delivering products to the customers on the go. Okay. That's where I stop. Okay. And, and then, then what happens? And, uh, then I go, did, then as I continue talking, I press, right? I don't wait. I just keep okay, talking. Yep. So I press and I say, you do realize that everybody's ordering online right now. Every single person. So much that the businesses depend on it. It's like their primary sale of their products. So much that they don't even have enough staff to manage it. And there's people waiting outside nonstop, people leaving their orders. People are not even wanting to stay. They're switching to another place. The loyalty goes down. You and I have experienced this already. Okay, see what happened? I didn't read what's on the slide. Exactly. What, what I said has nothing to do with what's on the slide mm -hmm. because they can read. I'm assuming mm -hmm. they can read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, I add more value to it. So when they read, they're like, this makes sense. Yes, you're right. I, I also felt that too. You know, last time, and, and sometimes that stopped me. Man, I went to the store yesterday. They said my order was ready and I couldn't get it. I'm like, I know. So it becomes like a therapy session. <laughs> Now, wait, have they seen this deck? How many of them have seen this deck before you're giving this presentation? I would say 50-50. 50-50. Okay, great. 50 -50, okay. 50 -50, yeah. So then next solution. I said, so look, what we realize is that, yes, there's tons of software coming in and there's so many people in there you can add, but you know, that, that's not going to help get your product from behind the shelf to you. It's not going to move it. You know that too. Wouldn't you prefer just going in, take your order and just walking out in less than a minute? Like absolutely would love that. Wouldn't you love the staff if you're working there to just be there, focus on making those products and not worry about making sure this goes to you and have it all contactless and not have to worry about viruses or anything like that? It's like, yes, I do. So now the communication is the question and answer. It's not me trying to convince him something. It's like, are we on the same page? Do you realize this what I'm doing? So then after that, we'll say, well, that's why we need hardware, something physical to protect and to deliver this product to the customers in real time. I'm not saying how, that's what we need. Are we on the same page there? 
It's like saying, do you want to walk every single time to go from A to B? You can bicycle, but in the winter, it's terrible. There's this platform we call the car. They'll take you from there to there in a convenient, beautiful chair. How it works, no clues. Like, yes, I would like that. So this is where that covers up a high level way of explaining that current solutions in the market is not solving it. And we definitely seems to need something else. Does that okay. resonate? Okay, perfect. So then you're asking questions and you're just checking the temperature every single time as you Correct. go. So what I love and I want to point out about this is one, you're right. You're not reading the slide. You're not insulting okay. the intelligence of, you know, we're not in grade school where you're just going to read the slide. Second is you're letting your personality shine, especially a passion for the problem. And, you know, so that's all about building that team. So some investors aren't going to resonate or some investors aren't going to connect with you on a personality level. And that's okay. But you're shining through and you're presenting yourself a very authentic executive presence is what I would say. And as a thoughtful founder and some like the, the right ones, the right investors are going to connect with you on a personal level. And that's what's working for you at this point in time. Yes. That's, okay. that's what it comes down to, honestly. Yes. Okay. So now let me just browse there again. I, this, this time has just flown by. It's crazy. So let's just take a look. Um, so you had the market, which is great. Pick a word, become primary source, um, untapped market, and then the product. So you show this again, and it's simple. Step one, two, three. One, it's two, not three. complicated. That's it. I love it. Correct. Okay. Correct. Then your business model, you you broke it down. You're showing your logic, how you're going to make money. Um, Ghost kitchens. That's another thing. Scalable automation, uh, competition, labor cannot complete compete. Okay. So let's talk about this competition slide here. Okay. Like, how is it like, we don't have a magic quadrant model with all the features Mm -hmm. and stuff. How did you end up here? Mm -hmm. I did have them before and I also had like a differentiation between like the shelving units and between like behind the counter and even those robots that go. And I'm like, look, at the end of the day, what's the core principle behind all of this? It is Mm. digital orders is the reason that came through and the logistics has been analog for the most part. No matter what you do, the labor has reached its limit. If I do 600 orders a minute, you're screwed. And if you have no idea what's going on inside, which means you have no platform to communicate back without labor, you're also screwed. So it comes down to labor. I'm not saying that labor needs to go. I'm saying there's certain instances where labor has reached its limit. So made it very simple. If you disagree with this, we are not even on the same page or even the same book. (laughs) Okay, that's great. So then uh, compare advantage, that's, you know, self-evident fundraise. 1 million convertible note. And then you've got your team to show that your team, you know, great logos. We're the team to pull that off. And then you, you do go into some detail in terms of your timeline. Uh, and that's it. That's the last slide. That's yeah. That's it. So for the very... most part, I never, I never show the timeline. I never, ever show the timeline. Okay. Fantastic. So then, so let's, and I know there's so many other things that go into a pitch and what have you, but I kind of want to focus on, what advice then would you give to other founders who are might have been in the same spot, have a, a really dense pitch deck and you know about to go there? How do they get to the point where it's just an elegant pitch deck? It's a concise pitch. What advice would you give those founders? You need to pitch it to people that you don't know. Hmm and look at how they are focused on what you're saying and what they're looking at the deck at the same time. Remember, when you're presenting a deck, this other person on the other side is doing two things. They're looking at your deck and they're listening to you. You, on the other hand, are familiar with the deck. So Mm -hmm. to you, you only talk, right? And for the most part, you repeat what's saying on the deck. So you quickly realize you have to make it really simple. You put a statement, just a simple statement, and your job is to explain it in detail, tell your story, how you came up with that statement, right? That's not on the deck, but that one statement has to be enough to create intrigue and be logical at the same time. 
This is the most difficult part. But the only way to get there is to keep, keep in presenting to people that you don't know, to be okay with hearing that, I, I don't know what you're saying. It's like, oh, you're not in the space to understand this. Well, why, why should he? Why should that person be in that space? So you want to speak it to a person, to a kid. Like my goal was an 11 year old can get to a point, can get to what I'm trying to say. Perfect. And be logical in that sense. So that would be my direction. It is not easy, but also helps you realize, do I even have a good product? Hmm. Do I even have a good solution? Is this even my right market? You take that feedback, not because you want to make a better deck, it's you want to make sure that you have the right product, you have the target market, you have the target communication. Is this my business model makes sense? So it's a testing, you're in a testing period. Your deck will never be concluded. It's a process that goes into infinity. <laughs> okay, how many times have you updated and changed your deck? Well, well, I, uplo I upload that in my Google Drive, right? And Google Drive is a feature if you have the same file name, it increases the revision number. I think mine is up to like 123 or something like that. Since early on, obviously, but... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love it. Okay. Again, we could, we could talk all day. I love it. Like this time has flown by so fast. I, I can't even believe we spent this amount of time talking. So again, I, I so appreciate your insights and, and your approach and just the way that you're communicating. So selfish question, you've been part of founder groups for quite some time. We've interacted like you're part of different communities. What's it been like for you? What, what are the best parts? Like, what would you advise other founders that are in our founder groups community as well? Take it to take advantage Each, of the community. Of course, of course, is feel that you're in a family, right? Feel that you are part of a family where everybody is actually looking out for each other. And, you know, it's okay to kind of push, make yourself accountable, do whatever you like to. But this is a group of people who everybody wants the best. However, when we help one another, when we guide, look, we can't help one another. We can only guide one another, but you have to help yourself. That's important. But the more that energy is there in the group, the more the abundance of guidance will continue to raise up and will make better for everybody. And it's okay. And, and I love it. The groups pitch with each other, give some feedback, and somebody would have certain experiences. Others don't. At the end of the day, each founder needs to decide upon themselves how they want to do their deck. There's no right answers, there's no wrong answers, but you have the opportunity to be surrounded by guidance of people from different experiences. And what I loved about it is that I was interacting with people in the hard tech space, in the soft tech space or food beverage space to see perspectives that I would not otherwise able to, especially in the pandemic and going out and reaching out to people, take that opportunity. People like to be heard and people like to be listened and people like to talk. Make sure it's effective and go back. Every feedback that you feel is appropriate, meditate on it and see how you want to make it your own. So this is what I really loved about it. And each one of these people in the founders groups are also connected to many other groups, right? Open yourself up and bring that value back. Ultimately, you want to encourage others because they've encouraged you. Amazing. Okay, we got time for one last question and request. Let me pose it to you. If you had to give one word of encouragement, one piece of advice, one piece of wisdom that's just going to, you know, haunt all the founders with enduring value. They're just going to put it on a shirt or make it a mantra or something like that. What advice would you give to all the founders in any position, situation? If Tough you're question. Ever in a position, if you're ever in a position where you felt that, oh, do I really want to do this company? because you got to that point. Now you have reached a mental blockage, which means you have reached a point where you're not doing this out of your heart. It's not a play anymore for you. It became just work. My suggestions are two things, quit or take a break and reground yourself and remind yourself beyond money, beyond anything else, why are you doing this? Because if it is just about money, I say quit. Hmm. That's beautiful. Tying it back to the things that you said before, money can be motivating. That's great. But what you're talking about, the heart, that's that center of devotion, being grounded and being devoted to something from the heart. If you do that, you've got all the motivation that you need. That's how I would interpret it. 
Absolutely. The mind is good for intellect and it's like an AI. It's based on memory. It cannot come up with something terribly new. The heart is intelligence. That's where ideas are coming from. This is where the creative process needs its time. That it needs to blossom. When the heart, when the mind is first, it's usually a guidance and a guarding system, meaning it's there to defend you and fear-based mentality. The heart is where you need the creation process. If you put your mind first, meaning that you want to be as comfortable so that you can create. No. The heart means that I will create regardless of the environment with me. My mind has one job. My mind is my employee. My mind is not me. My mind needs to follow the heart's orders, no matter how difficult it is. Always find a way for my heart to come out, right? So put yourself in an environment in a way that that can happen. Remove the things that you don't need. Connect with the people that only does great things with your heart. And because that's the only way you can believe in yourself, where you are who you are, Other, because the company reflects you. Everything you put on it is you. So make it most of it your heart. The mental is just math. <laughs> math we can solve. Let's get the creative part out. That's my, uh, that's my guidance. <laughs> like I said, this has been a spiritual experience. So thank you for reminding you. me um, about the heart of it all. So once again, I appreciate it. Um, Haitham, you are a scholar and a gentleman, and it's a pleasure to have you as part of Final Groups. I, I'm very humbled to be here. Thanks to you, Ed. Thank you for helping me being where I am today. I appreciate it a lot. 